that if I went to my grave, you know, the, the next day I would have been fine. Because <laughs> that, that, that sealed the deal for me as a musician. And it gave me permission somehow, a few years later, gave me permission inside to say, now start your textile career. Now, now put, put the flute down and, you know, be a painter that you really want to be. And it, and it was very freeing, that experience, and it really was, you know, it was a milestone in my life as an artist. And on that note, we'll go to Q&A. <coughs> We've got about uh, 10 minutes, if anyone has any questions for Kim Parker. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Kelly. Hi, Kelly. I'm so glad to be here today. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions. First, how did you find a husband that's so supportive? <laughs> <laughs> it's just unbelievable. He's sitting here and he's just gleaming. <laughs> well, uh, it took a couple of rounds. <laughs> but uh, three is a lucky number. <laughs> I didn't know that. You know, I don't, I don't oppose it. I know there are a lot of beautiful things that can be created in this way. Um, my husband does a lot of that. But um, I personally, the sensuality that pigment and brush bring into my life, there is no equal to it. I will never give up a brush for a mouse. Because I really think there's a lot of sp spontaneity that occurs, a human error that's beautiful. We have to embrace human error and human imperfection, you know. and. And I think paint, pigment, you know, we shouldn't become so computerized and so, uh, you know, um, worried about how every little thing turns out, being perfect, you know, that's just not my, the way I approach anything. I, I love when people say to me, how come you left that in there, you know, like that big blob in that silk design, you know, like that big bleed, and I'm like, you know, <laughs> I love it. You know, actually, I won't say who in my colleagues, one of my colleagues, though, um, but I know it's a little, this is a little dirty story, but um, <laughs> I, one of my silk designs, which became Mums and Asters, uh, I, my, my brush, you know, nervously or whatever, hit the, the silk and created this, like, blob somewhere on the design. And somebody ripped me off, with, you know, in a, in a copyright uh, lawsuit, you know, that we infringement suit that we've been in, and they even copied the accident, <laughs> which I thought was really hysterical. <laughs> they just they have to have it all. I guess. <laughs> Please ask questions freely while we have Kim here. We want to be able to get you give the opportunity to ask questions. Yes. Sir. Well, I work with a company in San Francisco called Editions Limited, and they are an art reproduction company. And what happens with that is that they, um, I create the canvases, you know, and they reproduce it on canvas or, t or, or poster. And they have all of these connections to corporate America, you know, and, um, and anyone, anyone from furniture stores, you know, like Crate and Barrel to, uh, you know, corporations all across America. So these people are out there doing that and bringing more color in, thankfully, you know, to offices. And a lot of my work has been in that, those kinds of environments. Hi. Um, Hi. You've talked about um, merchandising the work and the, the licensing. Can you talk a little bit about that moment when you first turned over one of your designs to be produced by someone else and how you handled that and what's involved in that? Um, it depends on the product, you know, that you are dealing with. Sometimes you have a much closer hands-on type of uh, 
you know, rapport with the company you're working with. Like with stationery, it's like, you know, no big deal. You design something, you give it over, they produce it, it comes a box of cards. Uh, with my rugs, for instance, you know, um, I love working with the rug company because they understand the integrity of the bleed in silk, of the accident. They don't mess with your color. They don't mess with your line. They, they understand that it should be an exact translation and we're all on the same page so everyone's happy. But then you get the occasional person who is extremely difficult, you know, and who wants to say please the buyer at Bloomingdale's, make sure that, you know, that person is really happy with the, you know, the way the pillows are on the bed and suddenly, you know, you go, you go to the floor of Bloomingdale's and you see, you know, the pretty ensemble that you put together thoughtfully with a hideous pillow on top of it, you know, that some Bloomingdale's buyer <laughs> seemed to need to have on that bed and you're, you, you know, there's no, you know, it's a disconnect and you're, you're unhappy with it but you have to live with it sometimes because they're, they're merchandising on their floor and these are things that you know I've encountered that I wasn't too thrilled about which now I'll not have to encounter going forward with the people I'm going to be working with but um, you know in old relationships things like that happen and you sometimes you have to gracefully accept it even if you know it's not your aesthetic point of view did that help? <laughs> Pat? Rehearsal. Rehearsal, I'm yeah. sorry. That's okay. Was at time. So my, my question is, is there any one piece of advice you might give to people who are coming out of school and besides the sort of uh, ability to go back over what people punch you down or hmm. get fired? Not that I'm looking for that path, but I want to be sure that um, I know this is what I want to do. And I'm coming from a corporate world too, so it really spoke to me when you said that. What do you do? Um, I'm not doing anything. I just quit my job. <laughs> I'm just going to school. But you're a textile designer? Um, yes, yeah. I'm doing pink, but I'm creating textile design. <laughs> and you're, uh, you're coming up on commencement, <laughs> correct? Yes. Yeah. Well, so um, I'm just asking if you have maybe one other advice you could give or just to encourage people to come out of school and have that. Sure. I mean, be open. You know, there are a lot of people who can't see beauty. A lot of people who can't see beauty. Look, the city, they're ripping down buildings left and right that have character and they're putting up these disgusting, you know, tall characterless edifices, you know, and New York, as we see New York being peeled away in this sense, which is pretty horrible. Um, you know, a lot of people reflect that too, unfortunately. You will encounter people who are unable to appreciate and deeply um, understand beauty. It's, it's, it's tough. But, you, but there are those who will. There are those who will. And those are the people. When you find those diamonds, you know, stick with them and, and work with them for as long as you can. And don't lose faith. If you have to if work with the, you know, people who are unpleasant and don't understand where you're coming from, you know, don't lose faith. I mean, every, you can change your job as often as you change, you know what. I mean, it, it, there's no... There's no um, no rule saying you have to stay where you're unhappy and that there's no job. I am such a I am such an optimist and idealist and I really I never left a job thinking, oh my God, now what? You know, I I thought something is gonna appear and hopefully it'll be good, you know, and then I'll just keep going like a salmon, you know, and, and getting my education. And I did, and I got little bits of education from everybody, you know, everywhere I went. There were jobs where I, they absolutely didn't need me to paint a thing, and they put me on the computer, and they taught me how to send things to the Orient and, you know, write up, uh, you know, uh, designs to get out and send and turn into yardage, you know, and I, I got my experience in all different ways. And it's all been really valuable, valuable to me now because now that I have my own label and I, you know, do things a lot on my own as well as with working with other companies, all of that that I went through all those years that I put myself on the line for without an FIT or Parsons education behind me, I got my education on the job, was worth it, you know? Now I'm free of all of them and I have the knowledge and, you know, and so nothing is futile. I don't think, even the worst job has something, somehow, you know? And keep your eyes open for that and, and, and um, stick to your guns as far as who you are and what you believe your work offers. 
don't lose sight of that, you know. It's great advice. It really is. I mean, and it's inspiring to, other than the students, it's certainly inspiring to me too. Mm -hmm. No, I mean it. We are uh, just about out of time. We have one more? Great. Mm -hmm. Well, I worked for a number of years, like maybe five, five, six years, in nine to five jobs in studios, in fashion studios, painting for, you know, dress companies, blouse companies, you know, you just, whatever, baby, swimwear, everything. And after I couldn't take that anymore, um, I decided to create my own body of textiles uh, on silk and on paper and see what would happen if I willy loman <coughs> myself around New York carrying a cases of these things and got my foot in the door and said to the designers at the Gap, here, I have a collection of these designs, you know, or, you know and, and the market has a set price, like they were 400 or 450 or 500 or whatever they are now, I don't know. And, and you know, if somebody, so I became not only the salesperson, the Willie Lohman who, you know, broke her back around New York with a set of cases, but I painted probably about 15 to 20 designs a night on silk. And I had a lot of turnover in my portfolio, and I, my Rolodex grew because I was very passionate and very motivated about getting out there and finding these clients because it meant my freedom. It meant my not having to work for anybody else but myself. And my husband and I could be on a Wednesday afternoon at 85 degrees with our golden retriever in Central Park while everyone else was under fluorescent lights. It was perfect. <laughs> I mean, we... We were just, you know, that was, that was what came with it. And then the, and the, the, the Rolodex grew and grew, and people would call me, Victoria's Secret would call me and say, you know, we need to see your designs, Kim. Can you come in this afternoon? And you go, and they'd buy 20 from you, and you, you know, make a mint, and you go home and have a good dinner. You know, and, and, that, <laughs> you know, and that's what I did for like six or seven years, and that was really the education on the job for me, because that, I, I went to every single, I had clients, every single one from Anna Sweet to Calvin Klein to, you know, Diane von Furschenberg and, and, and Jill Stewart on down to Baby Gap. These people were all people I sold my work to and whom I developed relationships with. And the very next step after that, after seeing everything perform beautifully in their lines, haha, you know, where, where I made a flat fee on a design sale and they pulled in, you know, their millions on whatever, my husband said to me, hey, you know, let's, let's, let's take the next step and go do the licensing show. So that's what brought us into licensing, but then we dipped, you know, it's a, it, it's a big dip because, you, you know, you're, you're up there, you know, with a certain kind of salary and momentum, and you've got all these clients all over New York and the West Coast, and suddenly you decide you're going on your own, and it means you can't sell those designs anymore to other people because that means they're going to produce your look in their lines, and if you've got your own line up and running, you don't want that to happen, and meanwhile, the industry had a million of my designs sitting in their drawers, which I had to sort of make peace with, but, um, you know, when I decided to go out on my own, it was really the best thing, even though financially it was a cut at first, you know, we're talking seven, eight years ago, um, but that was something we could live with. We lived with that because the excitement about having your own label just, you know, made it that go away mostly. Mm -hmm. So when you sold your designs to the Gap and places like that, you, it was a flat fee and they owned your designs after Exactly. Well, you know, if the interesting thing about that is some, some of the companies are a little bit more, um, as Eileen would know, you know, some will make you um, sign like a, you know, copyright, hand your copyright over. Some don't. So, you know, the ones that don't doesn't necessarily mean you lose your, your copyright. You know, you can, you can maintain it. I think, um, I think we have to go to the next stage, which is there will be book signing on the upper level and whatever conversations we can still have one-on-one. -on -one. But I, oh, my pleasure, mm -hmm. distinctly. Thank you for coming, and I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have.